Well, I'm Professor Claire Gray from the University of Cambridge, and I'd like to tell you something very briefly about our project on extending battery life. So this project looks at high nickel content batteries because these are the batteries that have higher capacities, which translates into a higher range for electric vehicles. But because of that, they also have more increased degradation. And there are different types of degradation. Broadly speaking, you can have batteries that gradually decrease in, in capacity, or you can have ones that are increasing in capacity and then they suddenly precipitously fail. And obviously that has tremendous impact on how you use the battery. And if you really want to understand why one battery does one thing versus the other, you have to understand what's going on at the atoms level all the way up to the pack level. And so our project focuses on this material NMC811 and graphite as a full cell because it's commercially relevant in electric vehicle systems. And our goal is to try and propose new and better mitigation strategies to come up with longer lasting cell designs and to feed into mechanisms to predict how um, batteries are going to fail by developing new BMS systems. But first of all, we have to measure and understand what's actually going on in the cells and work out what the different degradation processes are. So we've already assembled a large team in the UK to do this using a variety of different techniques, both experimental and theoretical. So our project is, has partners all across the UK, but is based in Cambridge as, as the lead institution. And we have four different work packages. So I want to give you a few scientific highlights of some of the achievements today. So the team led by Paul Shearing and Rod Jervis have done some beautiful work examining with computer te tomography the, the structures of the electrodes and primarily how the secondary particles are arranged within the electrode, what the uh, nature of the cracking is both before and after calendaring. And they've identified particles of no defects, particles of internal voids, and particles with a whole variety of different um, cracking and shattering mechanisms which change before and after calendaring. In Cambridge and Liverpool, we've looked at the changes of the NMC as a function of cycling. And so we've looked at with collaborators in diamond light source uh, using a synchrotron beam that goes all the way through the, the coin cell, we've been able to track how the um, diffraction patterns of the NMC811 change as a function of cycle number. And so just focusing here on the 003 peak, which is a measure of the C over, uh, so, sorry, is the measure of the interlayer spacing in the layered structure, we can follow how this changes as you pull lithium out of the battery, the layers expand, and then after about 0.75 or 75% of state of charge, the layers collapse. But as you cycle gradually, this ability for the layers to collapse at the top of charge decreases and you start to see the emergence of what we call a fatigue phase, whose proportion increases as you continue to cycle the battery. And by the time you've got to about cycle 900, you can see that essentially all of the, all of the cell is fatigued. And so that means you're unable to extract the last amount of lithium from, from the cell. So why does this happen? Uh, so my postdoc Chow Chu was able to look at the changes of the cell parameters and he identified the fact that the cell when it's fatigued stops at about this state of charge, close to the maximum in the C over A ratio, because so close to the maximum in the expansion between the layers. And at this point, that C spacing matches exactly the spacings of the rock salt, which grows on top of these materials. So as you cycle the structures, there's a tendency to lose oxygen and you move from a composition of lithium MO2, where M is a metal, towards a rock salt composition of MO. And so that rock salt structure, because it's matched size-wise to the expanded layer, acts to pin the structure. And so what's interesting is you can put back lithium into the structure, but you can no longer pull any more lithium out. And so this mechanism of the formation of a fatigue phase results in a loss of capacity as you continue to cycle the material. And so what we're doing now is try to understand how to mitigate this rock salt formation, control the spacing, and ultimately try to develop materials that are less susceptible to this fatigue phase. So what 
what happens on the surface of these materials and how does that impact then not only the formation of the rock salt but also impact the reactions of the electrolytes. To look at that we use for example TOF sim measurements and so these are measurements coming out of Imperial by Anara Egodero's group where she can for example see the formation of lithium fluorides on the surfaces of the particles. We can measure the oxygen transport through these materials and that gets, us, gets at the mechanisms of rock salt formation. So by using an oxygen 18 isotope, we can do a depth profile experiment and measure the diffusion rates and start to understand how the rock salt forms and how this is affected by cracking. So Wes Dose is going to talk on Tuesday about anode slippage. And what he's shown by using a, a DVDQ and a DQDV measurement is he can separate the contributions from the cathode and the anode. And one thing that's very important to notice or to think about is that when you cycle a battery at 4.2 volts, this is the full cell voltage and the cathode itself actually feels a higher voltage. And so what he's been able to show is that as you cycle using a, a 4.2 voltage protocol for the first approximately 300 cycles, the capacity loss correlates exactly with the um, anode slippage. So what that's telling you is that the capacity loss that we're seeing is due to the loss of lithium inventory by the formation of, for example, an SCI on the anode. But then interestingly, after about 312 cycles, you get a change in the, the rate of um, degradation such that you get additional capacity loss beyond that what you see just simply from the slippage mechanism. And so by looking then at the diffraction patterns and looking at the ability to fully lithiate the graphite, he was able to show that after about 300 cycles, you're no longer able to access or fully lithiate the LIC6 phase. And instead the lithiation process, instead of going all the way down there, stops at the LIC12. This then pushes the voltage up from 73 to 110 millivolts on the anode because we're doing a full cell cycling that then pushes up the voltage on the cathode to higher voltages and that sets off a second degradation process and much more rapid degradation at that point. So what are the other consequences of high voltage cycling? Again, in the work by the UCL team, they've clearly shown that cycling to higher voltage results in much more severe mechanical degradation. And you can see here the cracks that are formed at high voltages. Jennifer Allen in Cambridge is using NMR spectroscopy to look at transition metal dissolution. And so what she's using is the relaxation time of the NMR signal shown here in, in terms of the proton NMR, which is sensitive to different cation concentrations. And it's most sensitive to the manganese concentration. And so we can use this method to understand how and when different transition metals dissolve into the electrolyte. Jody Charlton in Oxford is developing new approaches using operando neutron reflectivity to measure the SEI formation, in this case on a model nickel electrode, so we can understand SEI growth for, for different additives, for example. Jezred in, in Cambridge is pushing the use of operando TM microscopy so that we can watch some of these degradation processes in real time with high resolution microscopy methods. And then in Nuria's uh, newer piece of equipment that she's going to describe, she can use a combination of different techniques to, to understand the different processes from a spectroscopic perspective to a microscopic perspective. Meanwhile, back in Cambridge, we've pushed the use of in-situ NMR spectroscopy now to look at full cells for the first time. And we can see, for example, the formation of it. The, or the lithiation and delithiation of NMCs and also graphite at the same time by using different NMR tricks. Most interestingly, we can also see the formation of lithium plating, particularly when we go down to low temperature. And what these experiments have shown is that once plating starts at these low temperatures or at high rates, when you go back to room temperature, you can still, start, you can still see the plating that wasn't there previously. 
So how can we develop methods to track what's going on outside the battery? So to this end, Amano has developed uh, operando Raman spectroscopy methods using hollow core optical fibers. And so these hollow core fibers go into the battery and allow us to track the electrolyte. And in one example shown here, we can follow the, the reactions of VC, a typical additive to see how the concentration changes as you cycle the material. So moving towards thinking about designing new BMSs, the work of Alpha Lee in Cambridge and Ulrich Stimming in, in Newcastle has looked at with machine learning methods, uh, impedance spectroscopy to try and identify the signatures that most closely track with degradation. And so if we can use these signatures, then we would have a method of tracking degradation without having to pull the cell apart or having to use expensive techniques such as NMR spectroscopy or synchrotron science to monitor battery degradation. So we want to feed our insight then into improving new materials. And we also want to make new, new materials to test our various hypotheses for degradation. And so Serena's cause group in Sheffield has made some beautiful new materials of different primary morphologies and different secondary morphologies to look at the degradation processes in these different primary and secondary particles. So in conclusion, I hope I've shown you that we've already identified a number of degradation mechanisms. We've found a fatigue phase. We've identified reasons why it forms. We've correlated increased degradation with um, a slippage and then increased cathode potential at the top of charge when the lithium uh, loss is significant that you no longer fully lithiate um, the, the graphites. We've been able to look and quantify cracking as a function of voltage of cycling and we're developing new synthesis and coating, coating approach, synthesis and coating approaches and novel characterization techniques to look at the degradation. So with that, I want to thank my partners in many different universities across the UK and leave you with a researcher's voice. So Amog from Cambridge is going to show you in more detail how he's used electron microscopy to study cathode degradation. So thank you very much for listening. Hi all, I'm Amog from the University of Cambridge. And in this short study, we'll be looking at the origins of intragranular cracks by transmission electron microscopy. DEM is probably one of the very few techniques that is capable of characterizing and resolving cracks at a nanoscale. We'll see how in the next couple of slides. The image on the left-hand side is that of a NMC811 lamella fabricated by focused ion beam or fib milling. This specimen was cycled 600 times in a full cell with graphite anode between 2.5 and 4.2 volts and then it was charged to 4.3 volts. These conditions might appear a bit extreme, but it was intentional to exacerbate battery degradation that would hopefully lead to formation of intergranular cracks. And yes, there were cracks, thankfully, as pointed by the red arrows in the right-hand side image shown over here. In these images, in the next slide, we are looking at a rather big intragranular crack highlighted in the red square. Let's have a closer look at the same crack. In order to study the chemistry of the crack, we obtained yield data or electron energy loss data from the highlighted rectangular region of the crack. The figure on the right hand side shows the position of the nickel L3 peak in the same rectangular region. The light blue regions in the center, which signify a downward shift of about 1 eV, is consistent with the formation of a rock salt layer on the crack surface. So everything so far tells us that cycling resulted in a crack and then a rock salt layer formed on its surface, which might have affected crack propagation. However, if we have a second closer look, it tells us a slightly different story. There are boundaries that run along the directions of the red arrows, indicating that maybe there is another particle here. So maybe this is not just one whole particle and there's a crack in the middle of the particle. So is it really a crack or just a gap between particles? Then it is difficult to figure out if it was formed by cycling or something else. 
Moreover, presence of a rock salt lake phase in such cracks has already been reported by a handful of papers recently. So how are our studies different? What's new here? Well, thanks to the hyperspike code written by Yantre to analyze yield data, we can extract a lot more meaningful information from rather quick scans at row resolution, and this makes us less dependent on high-spec expensive electron microscopes. So we can go through a lot of such cracks or gaps and study them in detail. In addition to that, to make sure that our work is not just about another crack in the wall, we will also be doing inoperanto TM studies to confirm the formation of a crack and then the appearance of a rock salt-like layer. These studies might also throw light on crack propagation in real time and also help us understand the underpinning phenomena that dictate battery degradation. I hope this was a helpful case study on a very small part of the work that we are trying to do. Thank you.